buongiorno. Buongiorno, ciao. Ciao. <ride> ciao. Come, come sono? Come, come vai? <ride> Tutto bene, che bello sentirti bene? parlare in italiano. <ride> sì, sì, ma sì, ho vissuto una parte francese, la Svizzera, ma ho imparato a parlare italiano qua per dieci, dieci anni, ma no, 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 non ho trovato il tempo di praticarlo. Allora, adesso, Beh, se vuoi dopo, stasera... tre, dopo 30 anni in, in Los Angeles, adesso parlo espitaliano, es, spagnolo e it, italiano. Benissimo, due. benissimo, benissimo. Complimenti. Sì, Sei nato a Roma, giusto? Sì, è giusto, è giusto, ma sono, sono andato fuori, al, um, al, so, i, 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 i genitori e io sono andato um, dopo sei mesi solamente, è la, è la parte ah. francese, sì, è Lausanne, sì, e, ah. e cosa? Sì, eh. so, giorno, hi, <ride> thank you, uh, uh, fili- uh, congratulations on... The, you, you, somebody just finished university, no? Or somebody just had a graduation? <laughs> yeah, like it's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you know? <laughs> well, I, 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 well, I could tell because of the uh, the circles under your eyes that you parted all night, and also, and, yes. and you look, you look much, much, much wiser now than you did in the last video I saw you. So. <laughs> Because yeah, now, thank you. Now, now that you have the diploma, you're like, it's a different thing. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, really. You're welcome. <laughs> it, it's amazing to talk with, with people like you. So it's a blessing, yeah. yeah well, yeah. people like us need a lot of help. So it, I mean, <laughs> we need people like you. So it's good. <laughs> thank you. Hey. Well, Nicolas, thank you sì. for your time. Grazie di cuore no, per essere qua con noi. E, io sono Davide. Sì, e, ciao. Ciao. Io sono uno sceneggiatore, ma io sono un writer. Ok? E, sono davvero felice che tu sia qui. I'm very happy to have you with us. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very honored. I've seen the list of people you've had before me, and I feel like... Uh, There must be a mistake. I, I feel I, I've been watching. I've been watching this uh, Netflix series about the the most hated man in um, on the internet, and this and this mother, the mother who cracked everything open. The, the the documentary focuses on her and her daughter, and this woman. At first, they present her as just a mother, not just a mother, but as the mother of the victim. But then, on the second season, you realize that this woman, the mother, was notorious in the eighties. Uh, because she had this innate ability to break into any party, any VIP room, any exclusive <laughs> event. Uh, she just had this gift. And uh, they, they interviewed her. They, they had one of these talk show reality TV shows episode dedicated to how do you do this? And so today, based on the list of people you've had before me, I feel a little bit like her. So thank you for having me. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's not okay. true. <laughs> thank, thank you. Ok, Fra, inizio io? Prego. Ok, Nicolas. Um, I usually ask how the passion for the cinema was born, but you <clears throat> grew up in the cinema, thank you to your father, Andre. Why did you decide to be an editor? Uh, because you are are also an actor, screenwriter, director, you know, you are a complete artist. You know, growing up, um, but I, you know, I had three sisters and um, two of them tried in various capacities to get into the film business. And I'm the youngest. And so every time they tried and it didn't work out. I got a pat on the back like, oh, Nikki, we're so glad that you're not going to be in the film business. <laughs> and so, but always, if you asked me when I was a kid, you know, as is the case with many children, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an archaeologist. I want to be a, you know, a stuntman. But every time I would answer two or three things, but one of them was always part of the film business. So, Eventually, I found my way to Los Angeles and um, somebody once said, hey, you know, you should be an actor. And I had a brilliant idea, the most brilliant of stupid ideas you could ever have. So 
uh, it was, I am going to become an actor. And just like that, I'm going to become huge and incredibly successful. And I will become a film director because that's what happens. You say, I want to be an actor. They say, yes, sir. And they give you the starring roles. And then uh, you become a film director because you say you want to be a director. It's that easy, right? So six years of restaurant experience later, uh, working as a waiter and not being so successful as an actor. Um, I studied a lot of acting, which was good for a director. My, my ambition was to become a director uh, to begin with. And um, I learned a lot as an actor about directing because when I did it, my passion was not acting, uh, to be very honest. I was very lucky, but I saw it as an, a, a, the plan was so wrong I think, I mean, it was such a stupid plan because if you think about it, um, it's the same plan as, you know, you know if, if you are a president of the United States, every president of the United States, once they are, once their term is completed, they are given a library. You know, it's the, mem the memorial library. Every president has it. So my plan to become a director was as stupid as saying, I want a library, so I'm going to become president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, because it's that it's so hard to become a successful superstar, amazing actor. There's so much involved. There's so much craft. There's so much learning and there's so much passion. And like anything, you have to want it so badly to become that. And so my plan to become a director by becoming a superstar and famous and incredibly good actor was completely wrong. So nevertheless, I learned a lot about it. And so as I was lucky enough to work, um, I was always on set and I would observe directors, I would observe cinematographers, I would observe gaffers and grips, and I would talk to people and how do you do this? Why is this this way? And always part of the education for directing. And then I was very lucky. I ended up working with a, a, a director, Umberto Lenzi, uh, on a movie. Um, and so I ended up working with him. And then I, I met uh, the producer, Salvatore Alabiso. Um, became um, friends and he gave me a very good opportunity to become a producer on a mini series, The Adventures of Lucky Luke with Terrence Hill. Uh, I, learned about, I learned about production managing. And so after all of this journey, which was about a 10 year journey, I finally talked to my father. My father and I had a bit of a difficult relationship. Um, he was an old school Hungarian filmmaker, a uh, very good filmmaker, but he believed in being very diff very hard on your children. He did not believe in giving things to your kids just because they're your kids. You have to earn it. So um, it was a problem for me for a long time emotionally because I thought, you know, well, you could just give me a meeting here or you could give me a job there, but he never did. So cut to this 10 years journey. And finally, I decide I'm going to direct my movie. I'm going to make a movie. And uh, I told him, and he says, don't do it. I said, I said, why not? He says, have you been in the editing room? I said, what are you talking about? He said, have I ever helped you? And I said, no, you have never helped me. He says, I'm helping you now. Any director worth his salt will have spent time in the cutting room. Go work in the cutting room before you direct. And I thought, well, that's okay. I said, and he's never given me advice like that. So I thought, okay, I'll listen to that. <clears throat> and so as luck would have it, I crossed paths with, a, with an editor uh, who was looking for an apprentice. And um, I started working with him. And I realized very quickly how important editing is and how obscure of a, of a craft it is because so many people don't understand what goes into editing. So many people don't realize the impact an editor has and the collaboration between the director and the, how important the collaboration is between the director and the editor. And so I was very fortunate to end up having a very good relationship with a uh, Oscar winning editor, Neil Travis. Uh, Neil won the Oscar for Dances with Wolves. And uh, he was a great teacher and he was a fantastic collaborator kind of become like became like a father figure to me and uh over seven years we worked on multiple movies and he taught me a lot about editing and in the end i i went my ambition from from my ambition which was to direct 
kind of um, subsided a little bit. I I still want to direct, but I I don't feel like editing is a place that I'm failing at all. I feel like editing is a very I feel extremely uh, creative, and I feel that in a way there's almost there's more liberty, there's more freedom in editing, there's more uh, creativity in a way because you're able to recraft a story and tell it all together. And so in the end, I find myself in this place with opportunities on both sides. But to be honest, I don't think either one of them is better uh, than the other. They're very different, but I don't think that, you know, now looking back, do I regret not having pursued directing more? No, not at all. I really enjoy editing and I find it a very fulfilling place to be. Um, And especially in these days with, technology where you can be so creative. I mean, you can manipulate, you can craft a performance at, at every level. And then I think it's, it's become more important. And in a way it's a little bit sad and I digress, but it's become a little bit sad that it's a, it's become very democratized, which is good, but also it has the implementation of, of technology has made people maybe misunderstand editing even more because it's, oh, everybody can get editing software. It's like, so it's like talking to a photographer and saying, oh, you have a great camera, so you take great pictures. And it has nothing to do with the camera. It has to do with the eye. And editing has nothing to do with the software. It has to do with the person using it. And so, however, this, this conception now that, you know, editing software is available and easy to use so anybody can do this, is kind of seeping into the the ethos of you know film companies and everything. Like, yeah, hey, we'll just get an editor, an editor, and it's like there's 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 a craft to it. And so, after all this time, you know, I, I've really come to love and appreciate this craft, and I'm very happy to be doing it. So, a very long answer. Sorry, I need an editor to edit me now. <laughs> no, no. It's a perfect answer. <laughs> Without cut. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. No yeah. Wonder. <laughs> That's every director's dream, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You do it all in one shot. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so easy. Without editing. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not needed. Not needed. <laughs> right. And yeah, I wanted to, to ask you tell me more about the Umberto Lenzi adventure. Because, uh, yeah, yes. it, it, it's a master here in Italy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Working with Umberto Lenzi was a very uh, uh, educational experience. Um, it was a really, you know, working, it, the, the conditions were very difficult on a lot of people because it was in, in Florida, in Miami, uh, in August, just it was after spring break. So it was extremely hot and humid. And a lot of it, luckily, or maybe luckily, a lot of it was shot at nighttime. So we were shooting nights a lot, which was a little bit cooler, but also difficult because, you know, when you shoot nights, you, you know, you, you get back from work at seven o'clock in the morning and you sleep until it's hard to sleep in the daytime. Anyway, but so, but it was an interesting experience working with him, but also especially working with great actors like John Saxon and, and Michael Parks and Lance Legault, but Michael Parks and, you know, Michael Parks was such a supportive and great influence. You know, as an actor, I had the opportunity to work on just a few scenes with them, but he gave me so many tips and he was so helpful and he was really, really very kind to me because I was, you know, I was not, I was me and I'm not, You know, I, I have acted, but I'm not an actor and I'm not a great actor. And he was incredibly generous as an actor. And uh, so was uh, John Saxon. I mean, working with John Saxon was such a, you know, I mean, in, in you know, like his, his Bruce Lee movies is uh, like, you know, Palomino. I mean, he had done so many Sea Wolves. He'd done so many fantastic movies that, uh, yeah, it was just a great opportunity. And so in the end, it was a great experience, you know, and, Rambaldi was doing the um, the visual effects, and so and he was, you know, so it was like it was a really great, it was a really great experience working with them. You know, it was so yeah, that was interesting, a very educational. I learned about I learned a lot about directing, uh, and you know, I learned a lot about how to manage a set, and learned a lot about how to how to make a film. 
you really learn. I, and you, I find that, you know, it's, you learn in all experiences, good or bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, you have worked on, on any, many films, and including two uh, movies that I love, uh, Terminator 3 and uh, yeah. Life Free or Die Hard. I love the yeah. two saga. And what was it like to approach this saga? Uh, it was really, it was great. I mean, um, Terminator 3 was a great experience um, because it was my first You know, Neil, Neil was, Neil was my mentor, Neil Travis. And um, he, he came onto this movie, but I think he was, he was kind of becoming a little more disillusioned with visual effects and less interested in visual effects movies and big production movies. And so he let me take on a lot of it. So for me, it was a great experience because my first you know, upfront credit and it was a huge franchise and it's a huge and great experience. And, um, you know, the scope of it, you know, just even that big, that big chase, you know, the, the crane chase in the middle of through the city where this crane is destroying, you know, destroying the, the, the buildings as it goes around corners and the comedy of Arnold as well. You know, it was, it was, it was a great experience. And, um, uh, Jonathan Mostow was a very interesting choice as a director to direct it as well because he brought something he brought more than action you know he, he was really trying to bring character to the story and he was trying to bring it to bring a little bit more pathos to the story i rather as opposed to just a spectacle i mean look you know the first two terminators were spectacular in their own right i mean you know james cameron is james cameron yeah. so yeah so <laughs> the terminator 2 is the first movie that i was uh, i watched in the cinema the oh first. wow That, that, that was uh, eight years. Wow, not a bad place to start. Did you have how many nightmares did you have from that? <laughs> no. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, I always love movie. So when I was a boy, a little boy, I started with visitors. Do you remember visitors? Yes. Yes. The visitors. A when French I was movie. four. When I was four. Yeah. Four years. The visitors. Oh, wow. Night, nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, Oh wow! <laughs> so now the the visitors. You mean the the French movie, right? Uh, the, the visitors. visitors uh, no, visitors is uh, a TV series. Uh, oh right, okay. Between the aliens. Wasn't, uh, yeah, wasn't yeah. there a French movie, a, um, a black and white uh, French film about the uh, les, les visiteurs? Was it? Uh, yeah. With Jean Reno. Yeah. Uh, with Jean Reno. yeah. Ah, yes, it wasn't was. it? Yeah, yeah, okay. And I'm wondering, was okay? Sorry, I thought you were going, oh, thought you're going uh, old school. Well, yeah. So, so Terminator was a great experience, also from the point perspective of the visual effects, because we were we were working with Lightstorm, which is you know, you know James Cameron's company, and so they were doing some, some of the visual effects, and so ILM was doing visual effects, and you know, it was a great experience because also we shot it on film, so there was, you know, it was a uh, it was one of the last, not. Now, probably one of the last of the series of films, big epic visual effects movies uh, that were actually shot on film. You know, not too not too long after that, we started. They started shooting on, and started do, making making a digital because um, it was just a lot easier for visual effects. But you know, the process was complicated. You know, you have to shoot shoot expose the negative you know digitize it, bring it in, then have to you know the, the whole complication of going back to the negative to to cut the negative and then you know ultimately create uh, you know the prints and so it, it was it was a, a much more complicated process so required a lot of heavy lifting from the assistants but uh, but it was a great it was a great experience because um also it was an opportunity for me you know i'd worked with um with marco beltrami uh the, the composer yes. uh, so marco We brought Marco on. I was able to bring Marco on to uh, a movie I worked on. Well, I brought him on to, to Terminator um, because I was using him to temp, to temp. And uh, I thought his, his music was really great. So uh, it was a great opportunity to, to give him a great opportunity. And that kind of started him as well. So it was really, it was really generally a, a fun experience. Arnold came into the editing room and 
you know, gave very intelligent and non-selfish notes. He gave very unselfish notes. He gave very intelligent character and, and, uh, and structural notes for the film, uh, which, you know, when someone comes in and a superstar comes in and you, 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 your first expectation is, you know, your, ten your tendency is to think they're going to want more of them in there or something like that. But it was quite the opposite. He was very, uh, he was very, uh, yeah, he was very intelligent and very, um, and uh, very, his advice was that of a filmmaker and it was to benefit the project. So, so it was good. And uh, Live Free or Die Hard was a completely different experience. Uh, not, not bad. Uh, working with Len, Len and I had just finished working on Underworld Evolution. And um, we, um, you know, he got this opportunity to do Live Free or Die Hard. And so um, I remember um, when I started that um, Fox, the studio kept saying, okay, so you're, you're Neil Travis's protege, and this is our tentpole movie. And uh, so, you know, when do you think you're going to bring in a second editor to help you? And I said, no, I'm okay. I think I can, I can do this. And uh, they said, okay, we'll check back in a few weeks. And so we kept shooting. We shot for five months, uh, five months of shooting. Um, the movie wrapped principal photography, and we had 16 weeks so four months from the day it finished shooting until the day it was out in the movie theaters, uh, 4th of July. Uh, so we shot for five months. We had, I, I don't even know how many hours. I don't count, I don't really pay attention to that, but we had a lot of footage. Uh, not to mention that the very end sequence of the movie was reshot at the last minute. It was reconceptualized and reshot the whole, uh, the F-35 you know, the hover jet uh, sequence was completely, Re re engineered and created from nothing because it was going to be a different ending. Um, in the very last weeks of this, which is, as you know, a ton of visual effects. So during this whole process, 20th Century Fox kept calling me and saying, Okay, so kid, you know, we we're giving you a big break now. So when are you bringing in the person to help you? And so finally, I said, Look, come on in and look at a scene that I've edited. Uh, and just remember this, it would be stupid of me to tell you that I'm fine when I'm not. I realize this is a fantastic opportunity for an editor. Um, it would be dumb of me to, it would be suicide for me to say, I'm fine if I'm not, because I will ruin this movie and then you'll ruin my career. And so why would I say that I'm fine when I'm not? So come in and look at the sequence. So they came in and they looked at the, um, uh, the sequence I showed them was this, um, uh, the shootout in the um, in the apartment when John McClane goes to pick up the kid and when he goes to pick up um, uh, the, the the Mac um, the, the, the what was his name I forgot the the actor's name you have all that uh, stuff Justin Long Justin Long he goes to pick up Justin Long in the I am his apartment generic. I'm so yes thank you for that I and I'm my my hard drive is gradually being erased so uh, um, so uh, um, so he goes to pick up Justin Long and there's, you know, one of the henchmen, one of Timothy Oliphant's henchmen is there sent to kill Justin Long. And so they start shooting him up. So that whole shootout sequence, uh, I showed them that and it's like, okay, you're fine. You can do it alone. And so then they let me, they left me alone. And that began a, a very gone, very good and long relationship with 20th Century Fox. And, um, they had a post-production Ted Galliano, who has become a dear friend and, uh, is a fantastic post-production, um, not supervisor. He was a, the president of post-production at 20th Century Fox and oversaw a lot of the making of a lot of fantastic movies, you know, Star Wars movies, Titanics, um, all of, you know, incredible movies and, and just a wonderful um, professional and intelligent person. So, and a great pleasure to work with him. And working with Len was really uh, exciting as well. I mean, Len had a very clear vision of what he wanted um, you know, Lynn Wiseman, um, he, you know, he and I had a very good working relationship throughout it. We were able to, you know, he would give me notes and implement the notes. And, you know, we, 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 it was, it was one of those perfect situations where he knew what he wanted. I understood what he wanted. And I 
we complemented each other. You know, he had an idea. I, I, I had another idea and they never, there were never, I don't think I remember any point during the making of that, of Live Free, where we clashed over an idea. You know, I've worked on many movies and there's nothing wrong with this, by the way. It's just a different process. They, you know, it's, I see it as my job as an editor to offer a, 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 if I have a different perspective, it's my job to present it to the director. And it's my job to agree to disagree. You know, my job is to make the director think of every single cut and make sure that they're, that they're necessary, that they're additive to the story, that they, that to make sure that the, um, the cuts uh, promote and help the movie. And so a cut just for the sake of it is, is horrible. So, um, Len and I were very much on the same page. And so, and we brought in um, Marco again, Marco Beltrami did a fantastic job on it. And, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Chitopoulos was a production designer. He did an incredible job designing the, the, the movie. And Patrick is a wonderful, a great human being. Uh, he had just, he is such a, uh, he is, he is, he is your, your typical French joie de vivre person. You know, everything is, he, he was one of the most positive people I've seen, I've known, and probably one of the most creative. You know, one, one of the challenges, I think, when you take on a project, um, a number, number X in a series of franchise movies is A, to be respectful to the franchise and continue with a not a formula because formula makes it feel like it's formula, but, uh, but you want to respect the, the genre. You want to respect the um, mythology of the, of the, the franchise, but you want to bring something new to it as well. And, you know, bringing, you know, Livri Dahard back after a long time was, <clears throat> you know, one of the big, one of the bigger challenges was to bring him you know, preserve John McClane. How does John McClane operate in this new paradigm? You know, and which is, I think, why they came up with an analog hero in a digital world, uh, which was, um, you know, the concept that, you know, Len had really is like, how do we make John McClane pertinent? And how does he manage, how does an old fashioned guy who handles basically issues with his fists deal with cyber crime? You know, which is something you can't, you know, obviously. So, um, you know, it, the, the challenge with that and the same thing happened, you know, on Wolverine, the same thing, you know, happens and it's always trying to bring Wolverine was the beginning of a franchise, but it was a revisit also of, you know, really of, of the X-Men. So, you know, keeping it fresh while being respectful of the original intent is, is, is more challenging than one, one, than one would think, um, especially when you're on like Live Free or Die Hard 4. So, you know, number four, you really have to up the game to make it interesting. So, you know, and I think, I think the, the concept here, I think was, was fairly successful. I, I feel quite proud of, of Live Free or Die Hard. I think it's a, it's a solid movie and I love the interweaving of the story and editing plays a, a big part in this as well because there's so many different things happening in different places at different times. And so it gave, it gave me a really good opportunity as an editor, especially as, as an early editor to really you know, show my, my training from Neil, you know, because it wasn't a very linear story at all. And it was not told in a linear fashion at all. You know, many things were happening in different places. And so keeping that tension going, keeping the momentum going while keeping you engaged was challenging as an editor and, you know, a welcome challenge because, you know, if you, if you, if you intercut too much, you lose engagement. If you intercut too little, you lose interest. And so it was a fine balance in Live Free or Die Hard to try to keep the plot moving and keep, keep it uh, interesting and engaging. So, you know, and then the action also was interesting. It was great. You know, I think the action was very fun. The elevator fight sequence was great. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> yeah. The elevator shaft, but it's also, it was also a great opportunity for me because Len, Len was very generous and, um, and also it's a function of the fact that he was so busy, you know, so he, he 
let me go off and shoot stuff as well. So it was a great opportunity, you know, for me to, to flex a little bit of, to, to, to train a little bit of the director directing uh, muscle by picking up inserts here, there, by picking up shots there. And so it was, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I think it, it worked well for everybody. <clears throat> so, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And um, thank you. And now I wanted uh, to ask you a question about your uh, directorial debut. Let's talk about this debut. Yeah. Oh, the ride. The ride. That, oh, you actually do. You, have you seen the ride? No, I, I, oh, okay. I don't have any information about this. It, it, where, where can I watch? It, it's possible to watch it. Some. It's no. a short. It, it's a short movie that I made a long time ago, uh, with a with a comedic actor, and it was it was. You know, I, I honestly, I don't even know if I have any of it anywhere. No. And I wish I did because it was interesting to see. But uh, it's it's basically a um, it's a case of mistaken identity about uh, a, uh, a it's almost as if it was Mr. Bean <laughs> goes hitchhiking. Yeah. Um, but on the way, he decides to go downtown L.A. Hitch, he's, he's a tourist in downtown L.A. and he decides <laughs> to go hitchhiking. And uh, to go to the beach. That's all he yeah. wants to do. He wants to get your ride to the beach. And at the time, you know, public transport, there was not the, uh, the public transport that there is in Los Angeles now. You can actually take a subway or a, um, you can take the metro from downtown LA to the beach. You couldn't do that when I made that. And so getting the beach was not that easy if you didn't have a car and if you were, didn't have very much money. And so how do you get to the beach from downtown LA? So Mr. Bean like character decides to go hitchhiking. And as he's there, he's waiting by, uh, he's waiting at the bus stop, but there's no bus because the buses were horrible at the time. So there's no, it's kind of a satire on public transport in Los Angeles because he's waiting at a bus station forever and no bus ever comes. But there's a, there's a newspaper stand next to it about, about this killer on the loose who is taking people in a van and killing them. You know, he's taking him up into the hills. And he's killing them. And so it's like, so Mr. Bean is, he's listening to something on his Walkman. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he's listening to his music and he's hitchhiking and he sees the notice. But he doesn't really pay attention to the, uh, the, the hillside murderer. And, uh, but he, he kind of c connects this. And this guy pulls up in a shady looking van. And this guy has this weird twitch. And uh, he's, um, he picks him up and he starts driving. and. He tries to have conversation with them, but the guy never answers. And he has this long, like dread hug dreads, and he's he's looking kind of shady and, and scary. And so, <laughs> um, and and so, um, what it, what ends up happening? It's just a series of misunderstandings where the guy makes a turn. He takes he goes to the hills, and then Mr. Bean starts to remember the article, and he decides at one point to, he completely freaks out, and then he. He, take, he finds something and he hits the guy on the head in a very comedic manner. And the guy stops, he looks at him and he ejects him out of the thing and he just leaves. And then he realizes as he gets up that he is on the hill and that the guy had taken him the hill way to the beach. And it was actually perfectly innocent. <laughs> so it's just a case of mistaken identity of like, you know, and it turns out the guy, once he gets hit, he has dreads, he moves his dreads away and he was listening to heavy rock music <laughs> and he couldn't hear he couldn't hear anything and so it was just a you know and he listens he's what are you doing he kicks him out and then that was that so that's the extent yeah. of my directorial debut uh <laughs> which was uh yeah i don't i don't even know how it made it to imdb to be honest because i never even put it on there somebody else put it on there, yeah so. because it's listed it's um there is no um, specified it's a movie it's a short it's a medium it's a documentary so i was so curious there was no wikipedia there, there's nothing <laughs> so no it's a short it's a short uh no it's um but you know what there's a there's another project that i'm developing currently with uh, some um, the, the producer in germany and um jim kauf is the writer and it's it's called money for Nath uh, money for nothing and um it's this is an interesting story, but that when it gets made, we can talk about it in the interim. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if if it gets made. Yeah, and you directed. Yeah. 
Yes, to direct. You know, I've been doing a lot of second unit stuff. Uh, you know, luckily, uh, one of one of the, my very good ex- ex- experiences was on um, Hitman, uh, the first Hitman. Um, was Xavier, Xavier Jens directed it, but it was a bit of a contentious situation between him and and um, and um, uh, Europa Corp. And so it was a strange situation where 20th Century Fox um, took over the movie and they put me in charge of it. And, you know, so it was, uh, you know, I kind of had to step in in, a, in an interesting way. But Xavier delivered a very visually interesting movie, but... I think the movie was too, I think it was too obscure and too artsy for the American studio. And it was an American studio who owned um, the production. They owned the rights to it. It was a very unusual situation where Europa Corp normally made, um, um, they normally, they, they, they had a deal where they did uh, negative pickups. And so Europa Corp would make the film and 20th Century Fox would release them, no questions asked. But this was a unique situation whereby 20th Century Fox had actually invested the money in the production. So they were actually producing the film. And I think there was probably a misunderstanding between them where they were expecting something different than what Xavier was making. And I think, I don't think it's a reflection on his skill as a filmmaker or him as a director. You know, I think he's a very good director and he has a very unique vision. But I think it was just a misalignment uh, of that. So, and it didn't. It didn't. You know, I think it was. I think it was probably quite difficult for him because in the end, they, um, they, you know, they had to. You know, they brought somebody else in to, to to finish it. So for me, it was a great experience. But for him, it was not such a good experience. But uh, you know, but with all respect, I, I think he. Um, hopefully, it, it benefited him in the end because I think the movie in the end. He. It may not be his artistic vision, but I believe in the end, financially, the movie did very well. Um, you know, I think it was made for 26 or $27 million and ended up grossing a hundred million dollars worldwide. So from the, bo- from the box office perspective for this kind of movie, you know, I think that's how you gauge these kind of movies ultimately. Uh, you know, the John Wicks, the, the Agent yeah. 47s, the, those are the kind of movies where you try to infuse as much art and character as you can, you know, or like the, what was it the, uh, the, 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 the Strathen, um, the, the mechanic, all those mm-hmm. movies are of a genre that ultimately live only if they do well at the box office. Mm-hmm. I don't think people go to see those movies for the art, unfortunately, you know, there's very few movies that kind of combine both. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I hate to sound like this, the American box office guy, because that's not what it's about. But you have to be, you know, you have to be objective about the genre you're working in and what you're trying to achieve. And I don't think studios are interested in making a, you know, an art house version of John Wick or an yeah. art house version of Agent 47 or The Mechanic or, you know, Die Hard or, you know, I don't think they're interested in that. So you know, and that's, there's nothing wrong with it. That's just the genre of the film. And so I think, and, you know, back to Agent 47 and, and, and Xavier, you know, I think he was trying to make an art house version of that. Um, and I think that's where the, that's where the wires got crossed because the studio was expecting a more commercial yeah. take on it. And so that's why, but so, you know, in the end I ended up directing stuff there and, and doing additive stuff to that, which, you know, was, a good experience, you know, and this is luckily, you know, and oddly 10 years later, I ended up being on agent 47 Hitman agent 47 with another <laughs> agent 47 movie. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. <clears throat> Quick mm. You uh, have a work on Kenobi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and You've heard of that. Sa- yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Another great saga. Yeah, you uh, you are part of yeah. the Star Wars uh, world. Uh, what is it exciting to work uh, on this uh, series? Yes, it was. It was very exciting. Uh, um, the first Star Wars, the 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 New Hope, I believe, was mm-hmm. the first one made. Um, 
I was one of the first movies I saw when I arrived in the United States. Uh, and so, and I remember it vividly, uh, you know, coming from Switzerland to Manhattan Beach, where I spent one year, it was a completely different thing. And then, then going to see that movie uh, was just an incredible and amazing experience. And so years later to be privileged to be part of that was fantastic. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversations had uh, early on. The, I, I, I was on that film. I was on the project. I, it, I call it a film because it was very much treated like a film. Um, you know, the director, Deborah Chow, the director, um, was really wonderful and incredibly smart and incredibly collaborative and very had had a very clear vision that she had planned for years uh, and so um, working with her was a pleasure because she was so you know it's such a pleasure to work with somebody who has a very clear vision because it makes you know it makes the process better you know you, you know, there's room for so much more exploration once you know what you want, as opposed to trying to find it first. So uh, the, big, the big conversations we were having was, you know, challenges we were facing were that this project is bookended by two known entities, stylistically, musically, uh, character-wise, energy-wise, everything. So, you know, uh, so from episode three to episode four, between episode three and episode four is where we live. And, Yet, you know, to reiterate what I was saying about, um, you know, the franchise and, you know, the goal and aspiration of everybody taking on a franchise or a new part of a franchise is to infuse something new to it while being respectful to the, 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 the mythology. And um, this was a big conversation we had musically, stylistically. Um, in every way. And because, you know, certain elements are already established and there are other things that we've never seen. So uh, it was, it was really, really exciting to be part of that and to be able to, to do that. And we were given free reign really from Lucas um, that we had no interaction pretty much, you know, as far as what we could or couldn't do, you know, Deborah was given free reign. And also I haven't worked episodic very much. Um, practically at all actually this is my second foray i just did one pilot of one tv series and this but i'm i'm told that it's quite unusual you know and it, i know that it is unusual to have one director do all episodes yeah so that was really what made it feel even more film like working on the star wars um you know saga and being part of the the, the star wars family is was really exciting i mean it's and it's amazing how the level of fandom, the level of love and hate. Uh, I mean, the, the Star Wars, um, the Star Wars boards, the forums are very divided. I mean, it's amazing mm. the and very it populated with a lot of love. I mean, and out of this love comes very strong opinions, like passion, really about how things should be and what should and shouldn't be, and so. That was something we were concerned about to a certain extent. We had to be mindful of that, but ultimately it was never, the story was never sacrificed and it was never at the expense of the story or of the arc of the character. And working on a project, which basically was about, I think the, t the sum total, the running time, the total running time of all episodes is about four hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is, <laughs> is, really a great opportunity to develop character and do things that you can't do in film, you know, and which is why I think episodic these days is really so interesting because it really al allows you to break out of the three act structure of film that has been around for so many years, which is really dictated by the time frame you have, you know, if you have a, and at 90, between 90 and, well, these days it's 180 minutes, but still between 90 and, you know, an hour and a half to two and a half hours, yeah. you're really limited in what you can do and, and keep an engagement. And so, but now when you open the door and you say, well, you can do 
seven one hour episodes, all of a sudden the three act structure can go away and you can make something much more interesting and much less predictable. And so being part of that with Obi was really exciting, you know? So, but it was also, again, back to the challenge is that we always knew we were, we were limited. You know, we had two walls that we couldn't go past and there are certain things we just could not do because there's so many other things, you know, it's not just a linear progression with star Wars. It's all the other characters. So it's linear, but it's deep, you know, it's, it's, it's multi, it's multidimensional as far as where you can, it can't go. You can't kill that character. The grand inquisitor is a perfect example, you know, in episode two, yeah. uh, the grand inquisitor gets killed and everybody, the fans went nuts. They're like, he can't be dead. We saw it in episode, you know, this, this, this series, there's another series where he's alive and this takes place 10 years later. It's after the, you know, so-and-so. And so yeah. it's after the death star is destroyed and the grand inquisitor lives. And then there's all this speculation about he, he is a creature that has two stomachs. So technically you could spear one stomach and not kill him because he has the other stomach. And so, but there was all this, all these things we have to be mindful of. So it was, it was quite a challenge, but it was really, it was a real pleasure. And, you know, I started working in uh, October of uh, November of um, 2020 and then mm. worked all the way through 2021. And uh, yeah, all the way through till April. And, uh, you know, we had many conversations early on. Deb and I uh, worked early on, on the, um, you know, we, we worked on the, um, the previs, which was really fantastic. We, we, you know, also working on a project, the scope, you have so many, so many resources and uh, basically anything you need to, to help your process. Uh, so we had, you know, uh, previs and post viz, uh, post is in the editing department literally next door so you could go there and say hey we need a ship that comes in and sweeps from right to left and does things and we could just give them the request and four hours later there it was we'd have the footage and so that was a pleasure to work with and that was great because being part of such a huge machine you know that is ilm and basically i mean limited but unlimited resources to make this as great as it can be so it was a really great experience and Ewan McGregor was fantastic um you know worked with Chung Hung um Hung who was a fantastic cinematographer who I also had pleasure of working with on uh, Stoker with director Chandler Park um so he brought such a great flavor to the film uh, the film to the project um, you know, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the team was great. We also had, uh, Kelly Dixon as another editor who worked on this. Uh, she did, she did three of the episodes and Kelly did Breaking Bad and, um, she did, she did a lot of great, yeah. great stuff. So she did, she did very well. She did, she was, you know, she did a fantastic job. So in general, the team was great. We had a great editing team. Uh, you know, our assistants were great. Um, and we also had a fantastic uh, music editor, temp music editor who, really helped us because one of our big challenges for this was the music. Uh, how do you bring something fresh to this? Again, knowing where you're going. Episode four sets the tone for the Star Wars theme, which everyone knows and will forever know. So how do you go, how do you do something that isn't that yet, but that is going to be that, and that still has that flavor, but that's still modern. So. We went through many, many iterations of using many, many, you know, we use Hans Zimmer, we use, I mean, we tried so many different composers um, as temp score until we finally found something. So and it worked, yeah, it worked out great. It was a great experience overall. I was very proud of it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely one for the books. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, <clears throat> and may the force yeah. be with you. <laughs> Always, you. we are oh. a big. Well, I, sh I should, I should have started with saying hello there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are a biggest Star Wars fan. This is oh, yeah. Lego Star Wars, and oh, yes. it's all here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm a big fan, and yeah, there it is, there it is, and. Yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, about um, technical innovation because uh, Kenobi is, uh, I think, one of the 
five series uh, that they are shot in the volume. Tell me yes. about the the challenges and the um, uh, facilities about the volume in the editing room. W what yeah. change? Because it's it's a different universe. A camera you can move, you can. It's super new. I don't know how to say. It. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, it's it's definitely a game changer. I mean, the only. The only restriction at this moment, and that's going to change, is budget, because it's extremely expensive to use. But it provides, I mean, it's, it is so, I mean, it's so great because it, 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 it's good for everybody. It's good for the crew. It's good for the actors. It's good for the editors because it puts you there. You know, I've worked on so many green screen and blue screen, you know, projects where yeah. you just have people sometimes, sometimes literally It's people in blue suits yeah. on a stage that is blue with blue objects in their hands and a blue background. And you're supposed to imagine and edit based on action that is not seen. And, you know, when you have the volume, you have all of this happening and it's incredible. I mean, it gives it so much, um, it, it, it gives it so much reality, but it also helps as an editor, it helps you, um, it helps you with the cuts because you can actually visualize them and it's different. One can say you can do a, a temp comp. You can easily comp in something, but it's never as good. The fluidity of it, it's still distracting. It's really hard to get good comps and do it properly. And here's the thing. You can get a great comp from a visual effects company, but as an editor, you're in a flow, you're in a process and you need to, You, you, you have an idea, one cut informs yeah. the next, and then something happens and you want this to go for this. So when you do that, you need to have fluidity. And when you don't have fluidity is when you have to call somebody to get a shot. And that stops your edit, your, your, your creative process. So uh, the, the volume gives you that, that fluidity. It gives you the ability to visualize everything. And it's, it's truly incredible. I mean, that's sometimes... You know, because we were we were in a place called Manhattan Beach Studios, which is right next to our editing rooms were 100 meters from the stages. Mm -hmm. So you could walk on and see the set. And it was incredible because it's not just around you. It's over you. Yeah. yeah. So and it's basically 300 degrees, maybe 300 yeah. or 190 degrees around you and on top of you. And there are times when you literally in person could be on the stage and you couldn't tell the difference where the set stopped and the volume started because when it's dressed properly with practical objects, you can't see that line, the corner of the wall, you don't yeah. see it and you don't know where it goes on. And the, the resolution was so good that honestly, there are times when it really looked like it went on. It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive and it's incredibly helpful. Yeah, no, it's, and for the actors too to be in the middle of it yeah. and and see it, yeah, and also just from the perspective of filmmaking, you can shoot all day long. I mean, nobody wants that, but you can. You could shoot golden hour. You could shoot a beautiful sunset yeah. for 12 hours, you know. And so there are no more restrictions. But you know, with that, I mean, Unreal Engine is now really incredibly, per, you know innovative when it comes to that because i saw some guys doing a homemade volume with a device you can attach to a canon or a sony a7s a7r or a7s or you know whatever a canon film camera dgi you know a red you can attach this this device that then connects to your camera which then adjusts the projected image that is on a regular screen behind you yeah. So you can use a home projector, Unreal Engine 5, this device, and have the same effect as the volume on a budget um, for free or basically the cost of the camera. So if you have somebody who can, you know, and they, they actually have items in their library that you can actually use. And I saw some guy do some home tests literally in his living room with a projector and, and a screen and a Sony A7S. And... Uh, He used the free elements. It was, I think it was like a locker room and a person walking in front of it. And of course you're limited to the size of your screen. So 
But as long as you, you move your camera, the parallax, all of that was perfect. Yeah. And it looked absolutely like you were in the environment. So that's going to change the way people make films. I mean, now if you, if you have people with technical ability who can, who can, uh, who have the resources to put that together, you can shoot a whole horror movie in one room, much less a house, you know, because the, the model for a low budget film used to be, you know, three characters, four characters, one house, shoot it in two weeks. You could do that in one room now if you don't have the house. You know, I mean, literally, it's, you know, it's incredible. Yeah. 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 yeah and the volume was, yeah, you're welcome. And the volume was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously the top level of that. Yeah. So what I can, what I can talk about as far as the, um, what I can say as far as the volume is that other people are using variations on the volume. Um, I know that, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, on the first Avatar movie, um, they used a variation of the volume, which was slightly different in the sense that they used it. The Obi-Wan used a project, basically used an LC, an array of screens. Yeah. yeah. And it's not a wall, it, it is a, uh, LCD wall. Yeah. And this is a, this is a physical representation of volume. Now, now I know that the guys on Avatar one used a virtual representation of the volume yeah. by which you, and by the way, you can, you can see this and again, it's amazing how democratized this process is becoming. Um, are you familiar with the Insta, Insta, Insta 360 go yeah. camera? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's the Insta360 2, which is the 360 camera. It's like a little, I think I have one actually. It's a, it's, it looks like this and it has one camera on this side, one camera on that side, yeah. and it shoots through. It comes with software that you can create a virtual camera in where you can take your phone in the software and move it around and look in 360 degrees at the footage you've shot. And then you can, do you understand what I mean? Do you understand yeah. the concept? Yeah, 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 you can so, move. Yeah, so, but you can, you, you're, not, you're not looking at what you're shooting, you're looking at what you already shot. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, like if I shot this whole conversation right now, the camera would be capturing everything. Then it creates a file that puts it on my phone with free software. And then with this, I can now look in the footage that I already shot and decide how to edit mm. that accordingly. So I know that the guys on Avatar 1 were using this technology where what would happen is they would shoot the actors, they would capture the actors, um, ILM would create the creatures, and then they would create a three-dimensional world of what they shot. And then he could go back with his camera, his virtual camera, and capture it all again perfectly in the same way that um, that he wanted it. So in a way that was yeah. you know perfect. So that's another implementation of the volume that that is a whole other level. It's more expensive, but it it what it allows you to do is that instead of the version we used on Obi was more um, more like making like physical filmmaking where you, you shoot what you can, when you can, you get the performance or you don't. Um, it's the same thing as going outside, but in this situation, you, have, you always have great, you always have the weather you want in the volume, but you're still limited to the actor's ability to recreate something if you want it. Let's say you have two people speaking, this person does exactly what you want, but this person doesn't remember the line. They, they make a mistake. So you have to go back and shoot it again, but maybe now yeah. this time, this guy's not so great, but this guy is great. And so with the, with the uh, virtual version of, um, of the, the volume, you get everything you want the way you want it. And now what you can do is you, you own that, you have that performance. You can now with your virtual camera, go cover it exactly the way you want it. So it allows you to basically do a perfect take every time. I mean, but it requires a lot of, you know, you go, you, you move the camera as, as you know, I don't know if you guys have been on, on movie sets, obviously you understand like when there's a camera move, 
there's a mistake sometimes. Yeah. And so, so getting the right camera move with the right performance, with the right sun, with the right everything at the right time is uh, there's a lot of luck involved in that. And so this takes all the luck out of it and it puts all the creativity in the filmmaker's hands. So we have two minutes left and we have to start another one. Sorry. Can you say that? Yeah. Are we, are we... Yeah. Only for the, for the wrap up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One last question. Okay. Quick question. Okay. We say hi and uh, <laughs> we go bed now. <laughs> oh yeah. You're right. It's super late for you guys. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, midnight. 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 Oh God. Oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that's dinner that's dinner time in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> See allora, you. Uh, tutti a trastevere e possiamo bevere qualche cosa, sì? No? <laughs> due spaghi, <laughs> due spaghi. Bene, va bene, va bene, va bene. Whoa. Moody. Hello again. <laughs> What happened? You went out to the clubs. <laughs> yeah. You in the, you, you in the club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, my wife and my daughter are sleeping, so I go out. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I hope. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hope the police is in the delay. I hope the I police the don't location. stop you. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I hope the police don't like, like, come out like, like, who's this guy in the middle of the night? I hope you're wearing some, I hope you're wearing some proper clothing, not like, not in your pajamas or something. <laughs> They're like there'll be reports of a madman walking the streets. In, are you in Rome right now, or where are you? Oh, I'm living in Roccafort. It's a small town in, uh, in the north uh, of Italy. It's in oh, okay, north. Okay. Oh, mm. nice. Okay. Uh, we have good okay. friends in Verona, which is not wow. north. Yeah, but close. -ish yeah. To, yeah. 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 So actually, I wonder. Okay. There's there's one thing. There's one thing I want to do. I know you. First of all, thank you guys for doing it so late for you. So thank you. Um, no, but, thank uh, you. but also, also, I'm really bad at these things because I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about what I have done in the past. <laughs> so when people interview me for things, I don't, that's why I kind of like asked earlier, like, can you tell me what you're going to ask? Because I honestly, and this is something I want to say, you know, on the record, yeah. is that for me, editing is a very, personal and very um it's not improvisational but it's a very subjective and fluid process and i never approach this any movie the same way any project the same way and so i don't have a methodology or a technique or a way to do it and you know and i i don't mean to sound artsy or heady about this but ultimately it's a very It's a very personal and subjective approach. And so for me, it's, it's kind of a instinctual process that happens that is born out of the relationship to the material, the relationship to the director, and the circumstances of the process. They influence your, your creativity as, a, as an artist and as a filmmaker. And so because of that, in the same way that... I mean, for me anyway, it's, it's my analogy is like, it's, you don't, I think it's, if you were to ask a professional athlete, how did you do this thing at that moment in that race? I don't think they could tell you. I think they, yeah. they're, because you're in a race, you're in a moment of creativity where you're doing things and you're trying ideas. And so it's really hard to go back and go, oh, this was my intention because I don't, and you know, that's for me as a process, personally, my process is very, it's very, um, you know, instinctive. And so, you know, I, my editing and my process is, is born out of reactions and collaboration. And so it's difficult sometimes for me to go back and remember exactly what it was, you know, there is a plan, but then there's a process. And the process part of it is very, um, you know, it's very, um, how is that, what do you say? Like improvis improvised yeah. because the plan is global, but the process is micro improvisational. So at every moment there's improvisation because this cut leads to this, this musical cue maybe changes things, this visual effect changes things. And that, 
you know, I wish I could say I have a grand plan for everything, but I don't think, you know, I don't think any creatives or any artists have a grand plan of exactly how it's going to be at the end. I mean, even when I speak of Deb on, you know, on, on Obi-Wan, Deborah Chow, when I speak of Len Wiseman, when I speak of uh, Jonathan Mostow, when I speak of, uh, you know, even Chenwick Park, who is, you know, I probably one of my favorite uh, directing experiences had a plan, but then as a result of our, of our collaboration, something else comes and something else is born. That is something that neither one of us planned, that neither one of us expected, but hopefully led to something better. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, you know, I, you just mentioned your wife and daughter are in the other room sleeping, you know, and then as a parent, you'll understand, you know, you make a baby, you know, and then the baby is born. And then your plan for the baby is one thing, but life takes it in a completely different direction. Not worse, not better, just different. Yeah. And the same thing for editing is that for me. And so that's why sometimes my questions may feel a little bit vague. It's just because, to be honest, the process of creating is so... Um, so in so, so so part of the moment and born in the moment that I don't record that. And so later on, when you ask me, what were you thinking when you did that? I mean, there's some moments when if I go back, I look at it, I remember, but the scope of it, a lot of it is instinctual. And so with that, it goes. And so does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, because I, you know, I don't like, like I said, I wish I could say, Every drama is this way and every action sequence has to do this. And so, but that's so not the way I work. And I'm not saying everybody else does either, but I don't, I'm not good at remembering all those things. You know, it was a, it was a feeling, it was an experience, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's like love making, you know, <laughs> in a way it's a very, you know, not every time is the same. Not every time is exact. You know, there's there's so much goes into everything that, you know, you you are such a you you're at the mercy of your emotions and everything that's happening in the process. And that every time is different and beautiful. So the same thing with filmmaking. Don't say that. Don't quote that. Editing is like lovemaking. <laughs> Do not edit. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, beautiful quote no. for. Uh... Uh, I, yeah. I don't know. I'll be sure. It's beautiful. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Not for this interview. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's beautiful. No, no, no. We yeah. can't keep it. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's oh, great. God. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so back to your, uh, you, you, you said you had a couple of questions left and you wanted to go to bed. Okay. So. <laughs> My last question. Uh, yes. Is there, is there a movie uh, you are fond of? Uh, I mean, uh, either a movie you are working on or just a movie you saw in the cinema? A movie that you love? Well, God. <laughs> one? Only one? It's difficult to say one movie because yeah. as, as yeah. for me, I have... Uh, <laughs> many, many, many movies that I yeah, love, from exactly. Terminator, Back to the Future, uh, right. The Good Father, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so many. The James, the James Cameron movie. Yes, <laughs> they're all really pretty, they're all amazing, yeah, he's fantastic. Um, uh, I don't know, I mean, that I worked on there i can speak of what i worked on. okay there's there's some movies like randomly that come to mind i love boogie nights oh, wow. um, i thought boogie nights was a fantastic study in mediocrity without making any comments on it i think it was like i worked on a movie a long time ago um called showgirls uh, paul verhoeven uh, yeah. directed it and he's sorry you worked on the uh, sugar yeah yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, I was, I was, an, I, was an, I was an assistant, and I worked with a fantastic editor. His name is Mark Goldblatt, who edited the Terminator movies, and he edited. Yeah, uh, he's done. Fan, he did True Lies. He's a fantastic editor, and so we were on this movie with Paul Verhoeven, and um, and the movie didn't 
was not very well received. Um, it was not a critically well received movie. But what I think, you know, Paul Verhoeven is a very, very smart, very intelligent human being and filmmaker. And I believe that, I still to this day believe that this was him making a movie, a commentary without making a commentary, saying, look at this, this is a world. And I think it was intentional. My, I believe that his intentions were to just present something without judgment. But I think people saw it as him making a movie and thinking that was his aesthetic, that was his, you know, that's his take on it. I don't, and I don't believe that. That's him saying this is a, re it's almost like cinema verite in a way. It was an altered <laughs> version of that. But I don't think people understood that. And now I'm talking about this because I believe there's a parallel with that and Boogie Nights. And I think Boogie Nights is very similar. I don't find they're very, I don't think there is a single mistake in that movie. And I think it's a very non judgmental look at a world and at a level of, and, and, and at people's dreams and everything that are, are so strange and so, you know, real for so many people, but also without judgment, but also on such a different level that then many other people. And so I found it was a perfect study in mediocrity and, you know, like the aspirations of these people are so, you know, are so low in a way for themselves and in general, you know, what they, what they think is greatness is so not, is so below what they could be as human beings. And so in that respect, I thought Boogie Nights was a fantastic movie. Um, so, but as far as movies I've worked on, um, one of my favorite experiences, I have to say, I mean, I've, I've been very lucky to work with fantastic people, um, you know, after doing Obi-Wan, but before doing Obi-Wan a long time ago was uh, Stoker. Working with director oh, Chenwick, Chen, Chenwick Park was just a, a, an incredibly creative and collaborative and intelligent director. And, you know, I just truly enjoyed the process of working with him. It was just really the most explorative and all of it was always and only for art and for an experimental and experience ex, for, for an experience and for to you know, tell the story in a way that was visceral and, and engaging. And I think working with him was just a pleasure. It was like, we were like two kids playing at a, you know, what, Oh, we could try this thing and let's make this thing here to give a shock and do this cut, this jump cut to this and intercut and the movements and everything. And uh, to me, it was one of my favorite experiences, you know, filmically. You know, uh, Die Hard was great for the process and working with Len was great as well. I mean, it was just, it was probably one of the most successful in, in its completion because it was just smooth and effortless. Uh, the um, um, Hitman, the first Hitman, the Xavier Gens is probably, it's probably not the best movie I've worked on, but probably one of the ones I'm proudest of because we were able to turn something that may not have been, it may have been received artistically, but I don't think it would have had the same success at the box office, which hopefully in the end helped Xavier's career, I hope. Um, so that, you know, the ability to, 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 to be given the opportunity to, to help something become, you know, what, what the studio considers success, you know, was, was you know, a, a good experience. So there's different experiences on different levels. So, you know, again, I hate to sound vague because, I wish I could say there's only one, but, you know, just working yeah. on Obi-Wan for all the reasons, for all the reasons, you know, that I just told you about Obi-Wan. It's also the technology, the technology of it all and everything. Look, and in general, you know, I, I feel very fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. You know, I don't think, I don't think anyone in the film business is grabbed by their parents and say, you are going to be a filmmaker, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, everyone who's lucky enough, like I am, to work in this business and earn a good living doing it, you have to feel incredibly lucky. You have to feel incredibly grateful. And you can't wake up any other way than happy to be able to be doing what you're doing. Because so many people, unfortunately, in this world 
are not given the opportunity to do what they want, to live a life that they want, or at least choose a career that they want. And so, you know, one thing I'm acutely aware of every day is how lucky I am and how grateful I am that, you know, for whatever reason, because to say, you know, I know I'm a good editor, but there are also a lot of other great editors out there who have never been given an opportunity, who could do what I'm doing, who could do it better, maybe, you know, probably. And, and it's part of it is talent, part of it is ability, and a great part of it is luck, you know, because, you know, I was lucky enough to work on a movie that in which I was able to connect artistically to this director. Uh, now, I bet you there were 10 other editors who are equally capable, but maybe they wouldn't have the personality that connected them to that director. And that is, that is nothing to do with my ability or my talent. It has to do with luck. It's the same thing. And this is one thing I tell every director that I meet when I meet them on the, on the first interview. I say, we are right now, we are on a blind date. And in 90 minutes or less, probably like in 60 minutes of this interview, we're going to decide if we want to spend the next nine months together. And really, you know, it comes down to that. It comes down to the chemistry you have with the director. And that is an intangible you can't make. And so you could be the best editor in the world and, excuse my language, the biggest asshole in the world and they will want to work with you. You know, or you may have a completely different ideological approach to things that makes you absolutely not suited to work with this director. You know, and so there is the luck part of it, you know, finding that connection and being lucky enough to work on projects which you happen to connect to the, the filmmaker with. And that's that's not a gift, that's luck. But I'm, you know. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have been lucky enough to be able to work with great filmmakers and connect with them on a level where we're able to make good films together. And so every day I wake up, I feel very incredibly lucky. So <laughs> uh, this is a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I mean, you know, we're, we're yeah, this is I, this is yeah. I I I know because I try for 20, 12 years to become a screenwriter because I try every day to have my opportunity. It's hard, but someday, who knows? Don't give up. You can't give up. You know, I, I okay, in my acting days, um, I, you know, I was in, I was in an acting class um, with, um, George Clooney was part of the class. Um, Grant Hasloff was part of the class. Um, Kelly Preston, uh, mm -hmm. now, now gone, was part of the class. And um, this was this cold reading class. And there were, we were about 20 people in the class and people came and went. And this, this, this class specialized, it was called cold reading, which was a preparation class for interviews. Because when you go to an interview as an actor for a part, Sometimes they'll give you the, the script that day and they'll say, wait outside and we'll see you in 20 minutes. Or they'll give it to you the day before if you're lucky. And if you're super lucky, you get three days. So now imagine this, you know, in theater and in, in acting, preparation is all of it. It's all about preparation. You don't have that. So this class was specializing about like, how do you get in the zone in a short amount of time? So the format of the class was we would go to the class at the beginning. He would, the teacher would give, would usually, there were two people. There were usually scenes with two actors, sometimes three or four, but mainly two, two people. And he would give them randomly. It's a you, 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 here are their sides, go outside, prepare. You have 20 minutes and, and class will begin. Then you come in and you watch people and you would, take turns, you know, like he'd, he'd call you. It's okay, you go first. Okay, you go next and so on. And in that class, you know, where are these actors that I mentioned? But there are other actors who were fantastic. And every time they went up on the stage, they were incredible every time. 
But what they didn't have that these people had is they did not have this, this desire to continue. And every time, and very often they would go, they would get jobs on occasion, but they would go and they would go for the interview and they would get really nervous and something happened that would break. They would lose their confidence because on the stage with other actors in a class, it was safe in the environment, in the professional environment when they had to actually do it in front of a producer or a director or a casting director, they would lose that, that, uh, that confidence. But so, and they left and, you know, we saw them, you know, they come back and they, you could see them declining because they, they, they were losing confidence. And the one thing that these other guys had besides talent was, I don't care if I fall, I'm going to get up. I'm going to keep going because this is the only thing I can think that I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And this desire to continue was, I think in the end, what made them, you know, who they are, which what was part of their success. Again, I'm not saying they didn't have talent, you know, that's the given, but what they had more was this, I'm not giving up the stick to it in this. So don't give up the writing. Doesn't matter how long it takes. If this is your passion, keep doing it. You know, because you can't, and there's many ways to get there. You know, there are many ways to arrive at your destination, you know. And I know, I know. I need a yeah. little bit of passion. Yeah, it's <laughs> only, hard. Only it's, this. <laughs> it's hard. But I mean, you know, the, the, the key thing is that ultimately there's not one way to go. Open it up as different ways to get there. And, you know, you will get there. Just keep going. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. You're welcome. And yeah, I want to ask you one last question. I want okay. that that be more vague as possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh boy. Because uh, this is a question that uh, I ask at every editor, uh, oh. great editor that come to to talk with us, uh, normal okay. people. So, so- <laughs> So, so don't ask me then. No, no. <laughs> I ask you. I ask you. And okay. it's always the last, the last question of the conversation. Um, okay. For me, as 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 a beginner, um, it's a, a, a important question. Maybe per, for a um, big editor that edit a lot of movie is not a, such a, a hard question. For me, it, now it is. The question is, uh, how did you manage the stress during the editing process? Because we know that editing uh, is, is, is a beautiful and incredible creative and artistically talking uh, uh, work, if we can call it work. But mm. it also, at certain point, at a certain moment, very, very stressful. So how did you manage this? Um, you know, I, for me, it happened, <clears throat> um, it happened, um, on a project. Uh, it came as an assistant, actually. I was lucky to, um, um, <clears throat> sorry, I have something stuck in my throat. Uh, it's answering that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the truth is stuck in my throat. Um, <laughs> no, um. For me, it was a process. Um, as I said, I was an assistant for Neil Travis for a long time, and and uh, I was able. To, I, I I became really good at it and able to do my work in a short amount of time. But this happened only after this epiphany I had is that as an assistant, you are asked to do a lot of things that are coming in and a lot of things that are going out but you have one machine to do it. And sometimes it's really hard to see the forest from the trees because there's so many things that are coming at you. There's so many, your list of things to do, scenes to cut, uh, input, output is overwhelming. And I don't know what happened at one point, I was in one of those moments where literally I was sitting at my Avid and I, I just didn't know where to go, what to do. And I just, some, I honestly don't know why or how, but I had this thought. I said, I can only do one at a time. I need to prioritize that. 
just make my simple. It sounds like a stupid and simple answer, but just make the <laughs> make make the list and just do this. And you know, I was I was at the time I was working on a uh, I was assisting uh, on a Barbara Streisand movie called The Mirror Has Two Faces, and uh, you know, Barbara Streisand has a reputation of being a, a very demanding. Uh, you know, she's obviously a, a legend, and so. But, you know, there's, you know, people are like, oh, she's difficult because she's demanding. And so I found that she has this, um, she has such a persona that people are afraid to say, to be honest about what they can and can't do. So, you know, for example, if you say, I want 29 elephants in this room tomorrow. What that means is, can I have 29 elephants in the room tomorrow? And the answer is no. But because she is who she is and people generally want to please someone like that, they'll say yes. Yeah. And then she walks out of the room and they go, oh, shit, how do I do this? Tomorrow comes and there is no elephant in the room and she has a meltdown. She's like, what happened? You told me it was going to happen. So I pri- I, she came to me and asked me a, a question similar to that once and said, I want this, 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 this. And I said, yes, you asked me to do this first. So now, if I do those things, this will go away. Is that okay with you? And then she said, uh, that, and no, I'd rather do this. It's okay. Well, those things I can do later, and this is how I can do them. And so the, the ability to prioritize and you know, to, to, to sit down and realize that ultimately, no matter what, no matter how big it is, no matter how much pressure, it, it will go away. You know? So you know, my approach to it is ultimately, I never think of the pressure because it's kind of a it's it's noise that interferes with your creativity. You know, focusing on the pressure and the importance of your deadline adds no benefit, in my opinion, to your creativity or to the process. Yeah. It only adds tension. Yeah. And so, you know, there is no there is no gain in feeling. I mean, it's hard not to feel pressure. But to give that pressure a voice and to give that pressure importance, I think only undermines your process. So, you know, even though it exists, I rarely think about it because it doesn't, I just, the, the minute I start focusing on that, I'm not focusing on my work, yeah. which then causes more pressure because I'm falling behind because I'm not working. So <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No. I mean, again, okay. it's, it's, it's important to do your best and want to achieve the best. But there's a difference between that and focusing on the pressure of it. You yeah. know, your standard is here. Your pressure may be here, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, your standard, your standard is here and your pressure is here. They're both equal. But the pressure part of it has no part whatsoever in your process because it doesn't matter. Yeah. Do, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. doesn't, yeah, yeah. It doesn't make you a better editor. It doesn't make you anything. It doesn't oh, absolutely. add anything. Yeah. So, yeah. It's the destructive and, and it's a destructive focus. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. David, I, David, I have a question for you. Tell me. How do you how how do you feel about the pressure of having to get back home to go to bed with your wife and daughter? <laughs> I no pressure. I need okay <laughs> <laughs> because because tomorrow I go to work. And, oh no! Uh, oh yeah, and wake up. <laughs> oh boy, um, this hour. Yeah. Oh God! Okay, go to bed. Go to sleep. <laughs> ah, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Okay, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you so much. For your a time pleasure. that thank, was thank you. an amazing interview really yeah. really amazing well amazingly um, boring probably but so no 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 no, no, no. no. <laughs> amazing. I, hope, I hope i hope it was helpful yeah <laughs> really really okay. very amazing a lot yeah. of be good kind. tips be kind guys be kind <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah yeah it's francesco yeah. francesco's work <laughs> yeah francesco <laughs> yeah 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 francesco per piacere <ride> certo, certo, certo. Sa gentile com'è, per piacere. Allora, mm. uh, amici, um, uh, ciao de... How do you say New Zealand in uh, Italian? Nuova Zelanda. Nuova, Nuova Zelanda. Esatto. 
allora, auguri, auguri di Nuova Zelanda. <ride> eh, grazie. Andrea, grazie. Prego. Buona grazie giornata dall'Italia. Buona giornata. Ah, Have a good bye, day. Grazie. E buonanotte. Buonanotte <ride> da Nuova Zelanda. Sì. <ride> Have you. a good night. Thank thank you. You. Grazie mille. Thank grazie you. ancora. Thank you. Ciao, bye ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao, bye.